Hey there, my name is Sage and you're watching D&D Daily. Today, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the Nature Domain subclass. In this video, I will go through all of the subclass's features, I will go through their strengths and weaknesses, and I'll include an example build. Before getting started, I want to talk about how I personally evaluate a subclass. If the subclass offers a playstyle that only it can pull off, even if it's weaker than it otherwise could be, I'm going to choose the weaker playstyle because I like the uniqueness that it brings to the game. So without further ado, let's jump into the Nature Domain Cleric. Starting at level 1, we get Proficiency in Heavy Armor, we get a Druid Cantrip, the Animal Friendship, and the Speak with Animal Spells Automatically Learned, and finally we get to choose one skill out of Animal Handling, Nature, and Survival. With shield proficiency and heavy armor proficiency, we can start out with chainmail, so we can start the game out with an AC of 18, and we can reasonably expect to top out at an AC of 20, which with very few exceptions is about as good of an AC as you're going to get for a full caster, so that's fantastic. Now, animal friendship and speak with animals may not be powerhouse spells, but they are something that we can do as this subclass that no other cleric can do, which is build relationships with animals, use them as NPCs, tools, informants. That's something really cool and flavorful that we can lean into. Now, out of those three skills that we were offered, animal handling, nature, and survival, I think nature and survival might be more viable than animal handling, but I'm going to continue leaning into this relationship with animals cleric because, again, that's something that only this subclass can pull off. So personally, I'm taking animal handling. Now for the druid cantrip. We're only going to get one of these, so it's important that we make it count. My thinking with this is, what can we take from the druid's cantrips that we cannot take from the cleric's cantrips? What area can we cover that clerics don't have covered? So taking a look at cleric cantrips, we have plenty of mid-range saving throw damage cantrips, as well as a really solid support option in guidance. What we don't have is a spell attack cantrip. Everything is saving throws. And though we have some close range cantrips with Cleric, they're not very good. So what I'm thinking is a spell attack cantrip, close range, gives us some extra options. After looking at it from that perspective, two cantrips really pop out to me. We have Shillelagh and we have Primal Savagery. Both allow us to have a melee option that uses our Wisdom modifier. This is incredible because we are a Wisdom caster and it really allows us to dump every other stat. The only reason we need any other stat is for Constitution, Saving Throws and Health, and Strength to be able to wear our heavy plate armor. It makes us really low on dependency as far as stats go. Now both Shillelagh and Primal Savagery have their pros and cons. Shillelagh hits harder from levels 1 to 5, and you can expect Primal Savagery to hit harder from then on out. But Shillelagh gets to use weapons. This means that if we get a magic weapon, it can synergize with Shillelagh. It means if we get an opportunity attack, we still get to use Shillelagh's bonus, whereas Primal Savagery we cannot. And if we decide to take any combat feats, like Polar Mastery for example, it works with Shillelagh. On the other hand though, Primal Savagery is just base better, but with those bonuses to consider, Shillelagh does stand out. But what really tips it over for me is our 8th level feature is Divine Strikes, which requires us to use a weapon attack. And if I'm being honest, I think the imagery of a cleric with a shield and a staff is cooler to me than a shield and a bare hand. That pushes it for Shillelagh for me personally, but I still think Primal Savagery is completely viable. Moving to our second level feature, we get our channel divinity, which is charm animals and plants. This is a very, very situational channel divinity, and on top of it, it has overlap with those first level spells that we were given. We can already charm animals. So luckily for us, the optional features from Tasha's gave us harness divine power, so now we can use those channel divinities to get spell slots back which is honestly what we'll be doing more often than not. However, don't forget that you have the other feature of the channel divinity. It could come in clutch in a combat with beasts, plants, or it could be used for utility similar to your speak with animals feature. At level three, we get bark skin and spike growth spells. The clear standout between these two is spike growth. It is an excellent battlefield control spell, something that clerics notably lack. Bark skin is a miss for me. You're putting something at a 16 AC, and if we think about who we'd put that on, we'd probably think Wizard. But Wizards, if they have 2 Dexterity and Mage Armor, they're already at 15 AC. So you're not really giving them that much AC, and it requires your concentration. I really don't love this spell. I think its best use is for Druids and their Wild Shape. 
Fifth level, we get plant growth and wind wall as our spells, and I freaking love plant growth. It may not be a spell that you're gonna use in combat all the time, but it will situationally be useful. But in role play, I would use it all the time. And specifically, I think it's really badass when you mix it with the cleric class. So now you get to be this guy who does these blessings on the land and the land prospers and grows because of your religious ceremonies that you brought to the town. And then we come to Windwall, which is the definition of a situational spell. You could easily go a whole campaign and never cast this spell. But it could be situationally useful against archers. It could be situationally useful against like a poison gas cloud coming your way. Or if you want to trap a vampire that has turned into its misty form, you can use Windwall to keep it contained. Of course, it can kind of just fly over, but if there's something on the ceiling that keeps it from seeping through any cracks, okay, it would work in that case. Basically what I'm saying is we may find a use for it, but I wouldn't count on it. At 6th level, we get Dampen Elements as a subclass feature. This is a powerhouse ability that lets us, as a reaction to any of our allies or ourselves within 30 feet, basically use the spell Absorb Elements, so we have the damage of any elemental damage going towards us or our allies. Keep in mind we have to choose one, we only have one reaction, but still, this is a super good defensive feature. 7th level brings us two new spells in Dominate Beast and Grasping Vine. Both are underwhelming and situational spells. That said, I can see a cool moment where Grasping Vine is the clutch in an enemy trying to escape. You whip it at them and bring them back and now they can no longer escape. Or you're facing off against a terrifying dinosaur and Dominate Beast comes in clutch. These are awesome fantasies, but I don't expect them to be very realistic. At level 8, we get the previously mentioned Divine Strikes. Tasha's variant class feature brought us Blessed Strikes, and now we have to choose between the two. Divine Strikes does an extra d8 of damage when we hit with a melee weapon, and we get to choose the damage type out of three options, Fire, Cold, and Lightning. At level 14, that damage extends from a d8 to 2d8. Now on the other end, Blessed Strikes lets us add a d8 to our cantrips and weapon attacks. However, it does not get the bonus d8 at level 14, so there are pros and cons to both. Now while there are pros and cons to both, I think Blessed Strikes takes the edge as purely optimal because you're still getting that bonus whether you're doing ranged or melee combat. However, for me, I think the ability to change your damage type to target enemies' vulnerabilities is too unique and too rare and too cool to let go of. So for me, I'll be taking the Divine Strikes. At 9th level, we get new spells in Tree Stride and Insect Plague. Insect Plague is a decent area control spell. It brings up some difficult terrain, damages at the end of the turn if they're in it, and has a fairly large area at a 20 foot radius. So we basically create this big area that de-incentivizes people to be in it, so they have to spend their turns getting out of it, all the while they're moving through difficult terrain and taking a bit of damage. I think this one is situationally useful, but again, clerics don't come with a lot of area control, so this is a nice addition to our spell list. Tree Stride, on the other hand, is situationally useful, but when it is useful, it's really awesome. You basically get a turn-by-turn 500-foot turn transport as long as there are trees both at the beginning and end, so in a forest you have some absolutely insane mobility, uncontested really. Situational, yes. Badass, also yes. Finally, at level 17 we get Master of Nature, and boy is this a really underwhelming subclass capstone. When we use our channel divinity to charm plants or animals, now we can use our bonus action to give them orders. That's all this changes. This will rarely come up, especially at this level, beasts and plants, we're past that CR by a significant amount. There really aren't any beasts and plants that should be showing up. However, this does create a situation where we can make a stampede. Because our channel divinity targets all plants and animals in a 30 foot radius, we can gather them all together, cast it, and all of the ones we charm, we can stampede the campsite. If you're DM's really cool and alley-oops you to do this, you could have some fun with it, but it really does take an alley-oop to get pretty much any use out of this, because keep in mind, your channel divinity only lasts a minute, so even once you do charm something, you have it for one minute. As a 17th level feature, just underwhelming in my book. So how would I build the Nature Domain Cleric? I'll just give you an example build. Whatever you do, it's amazing. Don't feel like you have to take this step by step the same way I do it. This is just the target I would personally shoot for. You do you, you have fun. I think one of the subclass's biggest strengths is it enables builds that require very little investment into your skill points. All you need is Wisdom and Constitution. That's an incredibly sad class, single ability score dependent class, 
and so we really don't have to spread our points so we can really get good stats fast. With that in mind, I'm going to base my build on that. I mentioned before that we need to take strength in order to use our plate armor. If we don't have the strength requirement, we lose 10 feet of movement, 30 foot to 20 foot movement speed. Dwarves, if they are wearing heavy armor, they don't have that. They don't need to have the strength requirement. They don't lose any speed and their speed remains at 25. But also keep in mind that there are races in the game that have 35 foot plus movement speed. So if they lose 10 feet, they're just like a dwarf. They have it at either 25 or 30 in the case of a centaur. <clears throat> so that is the pool of races I'm choosing from. Dwarves and any race that has 35 plus movement speed. Personally, I went with a hill dwarf. We don't require Tasha's variant ability scores to have the perfect scores. We get the plus one to our HP and dwarves are just awesome with their poison resistance. Dark Vision, they're just a super solid race, so we're picking them up here. And not to mention, I think the heavy armor kind of druidy thing really works with dwarves. Now with our starting AC of 18, capped at 20, with the extra hit die, which basically takes us from a D8 to a D10, we're as tanky as any of our fighters, any of the marshals. We are as tanky as them, and we are a full spellcaster. That is awesome. Something else worth mentioning when you have a character that is very low in abilities that they need to spread their points across, rolling for stats gets much, much better because you are likely to get one or two outliers, and now you can build a really strong character because you got that 17 or that 18 or even a 16 right from the get-go, which you wouldn't get from point buy. However, this class still works just fine with point buy. It's just worth mentioning that your return on rolling gets higher the fewer skills you need. Now my priorities as far as feats and stats go is I want to get Wisdom to 20 pretty dang fast, but along the way I want to pick up Resilient Constitution, so we want to start out our Constitution on an odd score, so that plus one puts us to an even score, because we are going to be getting hit and we need to have a really solid Constitution to make our saves, and Resilient Constitution is perfect for that. After we have those two prerequisites met, we can get whatever feats we want. We can get more combat-oriented feats. We can get more spell-oriented feats. It's really open, and you guys can do whatever you want. Personally, I would just choose in the moment and go with it. I don't think there's any set plan I would have for those particular feats that late. The style of combat I'm going for here is a Gish build. Pure Wisdom Gish build. We use Shillelagh and Melee, mix it with our spell casting, and we're good to go. Something really nice about Clerics is that we get to attach our spell focus to our shield and you are able to use your hand that is holding the focus, so your shield hand, to do somatic components as well. So clerics are in the unique position to have a shield and weapon and still be able to cast spells, where all other classes are gonna have to be holding their focus, clerics do not. So we're gonna take advantage of that and not worry about picking up Warcaster. Our combat style is when combat begins, we are going to cast a single fight winning concentration spell. Spells like Bless, Spike Growth, Spiritual Guardians, and Summon Celestial all come into mind. I'm sure there are many more, but I believe Spirit Guardians is going to be the clear standout. Now keep in mind that we are a melee cleric, so Spirit Guardians is going to get more mileage than it would with a ranged cleric. One of the biggest benefits about being a melee cleric. After that, I may use Spiritual Weapon to do a non-concentration bonus weapon attack, and then I'll supplement that with my cantrip shillelagh damage. Speaking of cantrips, I would read the situation and... Depending on it, I might pull out my shillelagh and go get in there with spiritual guardians, or I might hang back and use cantrips like Told the Dead and keep my ranged spells going, like Spiritual Weapon, for example. We have the flexibility to choose based on the combat we're in, and we should be tactically different. My overall goal, each combat, would be to end the combat with only two spells cast. We want to keep our spell casting really low and reserve our resources. After combat, we can patch up our team with spells like Prayer of Healing or Aura of Vitality, we can still be that support caster if needed. Basically, as a cleric, we have a very strong support and damage spell list, so we can take advantage of that. And we're leaning into our extra spells from our subclass to get some of that control element that clerics are lacking. Now, out of combat, I would definitely roleplay as a nature priest. I would bless the land, the people, and the animals. I would try and make friends with animals and develop my own animal companions. That would be really neat. And think about how sweet that is. We are a cleric that has the potential to create many animal companions, something most clerics would struggle to do. This has been my deep dive into the nature domain cleric. We are D&D Daily. We release new D&D content every single day. So if that's interesting to you, hit the subscribe button and I'll see you on the next one. Peace out.